Welcome everybody and thanks for coming. I'm Elisha Lee and my grandparents lived on Grandmams Hill Road. I grew up visiting, not living here, playing in the brooks, exploring cellar halls, and listening to stories of ghost towns and gold mines. I was an odd child. When other little boys were playing baseball, I was out digging bottles in the woods and drawing pictures of Civil War soldiers. Vermont was a magical place for me. Probably because so much, so much of the past is still here to be found. In my exploring, I came to realize that every cellar hole and every old building had a unique place in the larger tapestry of history. Why did people settle here? When? When did they leave? My desire to understand these things never left, but life gets in the way. It wasn't until I came back to Bridgewater in 2015 and retired in 2020 that I was able to pick up my interest in the gold mines and actually do more meaningful research. When I started doing this, I knew absolutely nothing. When I start things that I know nothing about, usually the first thing that I do is Google them. And in fact, this is what came up, the diggings.com, which is, a, I think, a national site listing mines. Uh, you can drill down into Vermont, then you can drill down into Windsor County and into Bridgewater. And there, are, there are 50 mines listed in Bridgewater, I mean, excuse me, in, in uh, Windsor County, of which 14 are gold mines. And it goes on beyond the, the image, but one of the things that it notes is that the mines are on the southeast and southwest plains of Dana Hill, and that all of the mines, they say, are within a half mile radius of point, meaning where they said it was, which when you actually get out and start looking for things is incredibly unhelpful. Anyway, how hard could it be? I walked up Baker Hill, headed, and I headed southwest towards Dana Hill with no map and no trails. After climbing up and down Dana Hill three or four times, I gave up. And I headed straight south, figuring that I would pick up the uh, Daly Hollow Road. As I was coming down, I ran into this, the Carboneau Mine. This was more like it. I kept going and eventually came out at the log landing on the Daily Hollow Road, about three miles from my truck. At that point, I realized I couldn't find the Carboneau mine again to save my life. <laughs> so I had found and lost a gold mine all within a two hour period. That was sort of embarrassing. So at that point, I decided I really needed to. Um, re-examine the way that I was approaching this. What was I trying to accomplish? Finding a gold mine is certainly fun, but it doesn't answer any questions. Why was it here? When was it built? Who built it? I wanted to find these things out. There really isn't very much actual evidence out there, and most of it seems to be passed from one writer to another over time and not, not really ever changed. At this point, I should probably note that this is a work in progress. It's not complete. My theories aren't necessarily facts. And I'm really hoping that when I'm finished, some of you can tell me what you know. Yep. I started with the Beers Atlas of 1869, which is an absolutely fascinating document. And there's 11 gold mines in Bridgewater on that map and two crushers. Everything, if you go out and you, you look for them, you find them, they're right exactly where the little dots are, with the exception of the railroad, which they show, and that was never actually built. 
The only problem with the, the Beers Atlas or with, with any map is it's, it's a point in time, and this is 1869, so it doesn't tell you what's happening in 1880, it doesn't tell you what's happening in 1890. So it would be nice to have one of these for every decade, and we don't. Another map, uh, unfortunately from essentially the same period, this is on the wall of the town office, and it's also, there's a copy at the Historical Society. Lots of great gold mine information, but again, really the same point in time as the, the map that we had, the Beers map. I bought a little handheld GPS unit. And you can, so that I could plot the mines, which are in, in yellow. This is just a, it's a much larger map in, in real life. And the cellar holes are red. And that has enabled me, when I found something, to actually go back to it. It's also got a little button that I can press if I fall and can't get up. Someone can come, come and rescue me. I then started uh, transactional history, trying to identify deeds that could be linked to gold mines. And usually the only way you can do that is, is through the grantor or the grantee. And in many cases, before the companies are founded, you can't even do that. It's just you have to know the names of the people that are involved. Uh, this is a sort of an interesting deed here. Uh, you've got a grantor, Oscar Washburn, and a grantee, William Van Waters, of Seattle, Washington. It's dated 10 August 1903. The land area is 125 acres. It references a prior sale from David Barrows to W.S. Worthington, and also the fact that it's the N.C. Baker farm, which puts it up on Baker Hill. So you start to get a sense of geographically where it was. Consideration was a dollar, which I'll explain a little bit about in a minute. The, the really interesting part is on the second page, where Van Waters covenants to transfer the mineral and mining rights to the Oriental Gold Mining Company, incorporated in South Dakota, with a treasury reserve of 470,000 shares and capitalized at a million dollars. And then to issue Oscar and Eliza 25,000 shares of stock. So that was, that was essentially their compensation rather than money. Thus far, I've found 65 transactions that I can absolutely identify to a specific gold mine and 16 mining companies that were doing business in Bridgewater at, at between 1851 and, and probably, 19, I think 1912 is really the, the end of that. Um, it starts to get confusing because one gold mine, one mining company does not equate to one gold mine. And many of them had three or four places that they were mining. And if you, if you we, won't, we won't flash back to it, but if you go back to, to the 1869 Beers map, the Mount Hope gold mine's in about four different places. Since I have Oscar Washburn on the screen, I might as well say a bit more about him because he was one of the major players in the Bridgewater Mines. <clears throat> Born in Goshen, Mass. in 1825. In 60, he was a jeweler in New York City. He first appears in Bridgewater in 1864 when he became the manager of the Quartz Hill and Pioneer Mines and bought the Perkins Farm, also up above Daly Hollow. A contemporary account described him as a gentleman of good education and refined culture, but somewhat erratic views. While in Bridgewater, he received a patent for a machine to make paper collars, paper shirt collars. He also built a dam, and he powered his rock crusher with water from the dam. And there's a contemporary account that notes that in, in 1865, he could have sold his gold mining interests to New York investors for $100,000, which was a considerable amount of money. Uh, he didn't. And in 1869, several massive floods washed him and most of the rest of the gold mines out of existence. And he, he ended up working in a mine in North Carolina just to, as, a, as a mine laborer. And he, he came back in the 1880s and he continued to mine at Quartz Hill, probably working largely by himself. 
up until probably 1900. I also started collecting newspaper articles from Vermont papers. These are often very helpful sources of information. This one was, this was the Burlington Free Press of January 17th, 1855. And you can see it's got a note of, of you've got a steam engine for powering the crushers. I don't know who Cunningham was yet. I haven't gotten quite that far. But, but there's a lot of information in those. So what actually happened here? When and why? The story is larger than Bridgewater. It happened in Plymouth and other towns as well. This afternoon, my focus is on Bridgewater. Unlike many of its neighbors, Vermont wasn't really settled until after the Revolutionary War in the 1780s. Subsistence farming created a fairly one-dimensional economy until the arrival of Merino sheep in about 1810. In 1839, the Vermont legislature commissioned a survey of the state's geological resources. And they were looking in the hopes of finding something of economic value. The man picked to conduct the survey, the man picked to conduct the survey was Charles Baker Adams on the left a professor of natural history at Middlebury College and later Vermont's first state geologist. Adams was assisted by Bridgewater native and man of many talents, Zadok Thompson. Thompson was a professor of natural history at the University of Vermont, a famed naturalist and an Episcopal clergyman. The results were published in 1845 as the first annual report on the geology of the state of Vermont. This is just a fascinating book. It goes through iron, copper, silver, coal, slate, marble, soapstone, and gold, noting where in the state each of them was found. The only gold reported was in Somerset and Newfane. Bridgewater was reported to have an abandoned soapstone quarry of inferior quality and also limestone. So in terms of why here, one answer is that the most educated men in the state had at least raised the possibility that it could be here in the survey. The second larger answer to why here was the discovery of gold in Coloma, California in 1848. There was no transcontinental telegraph until 1861 and no transcontinental railway until 1869. So news was conveyed by ship in the form of a letter. It took about a year for news to filter back to Vermont. At that point, some 11,000 Vermonters left for the gold field, going first to Boston or New York, then by ship, either to Panama and across, or around the Horn and up to San Francisco. In either case, a journey of about five months. This is one of the first articles on the gold rush printed in a Vermont newspaper, the Green Mountain Gem. Note the date, January 1st, 1849. The gold was discovered on January 24th, 1848. So this is being printed 11 months after the fact. Because of these delays, most Vermonters reached the gold fields late and eventually returned home having found nothing. So a second answer to why here is because there was a good number of failed 49ers in the area who were very much aware of gold, the possibility of gold, and the newspapers were full of stories such as this. In a sense, the local story starts here, 768 Shattagee Road, in 1851, home to a 30-year-old farmer named Matthew E. Kennedy. Kennedy's father, also named Matthew, lived in Plymouth where he supposedly owned a lime kiln. Bill Hoyt always said that he was a returned 49er, but I've never been able to find any evidence one way or the other to, to substantiate that. In 1895, the Rutland Herald ran a two-piece article, a very extensive article, in which they interviewed people who'd been involved in the gold mines, and one of them was Matthew E. Kennedy, who, who lives here. And he recounted the story of his father and, and what had happened and in August of 1851, 
Matthew Kennedy Sr. came to visit his son, he went off hunting bees. He wasn't on his own land. He crossed a brook, and it was either Dimmock Brook or Washburn Brook, and he saw some rocks in the brook. So he bent down, he picked them up, and he took them home. He later took them. He later took them to Oliver Pace and Hubbard, professor of geology at Dartmouth College, who authenticated them as gold ore. Kennedy's problem was that he didn't own the land that he found them on, so he said nothing. In September of 1852, he bought 99.75 acres from George Williams and Ephraim Bryant of Heartland for $700. On the same day, he sold a half interest in the land to, Ian, to Ira Smith of Westminster for $4,000. On December 2nd, 1852, Professor Hubbard finally issued a statement saying, in part, the, the, the vein that he believed was there could run the entire length of the state. Very optimistic. Kennedy and Smith probably worked the land for a little less than two years, and probably figured out that it wasn't very productive. In August of 1854, they sold it to a New York man by the name of Ira Payson for $11,000. That sounds like a really good deal, but the way that it was structured, it was $2,000 in cash, a $3,000 note due in four months, and $6,000 in stock in the Vermont Gold Mining Company incorporated in November of 1854. Payson only lasted less than nine months. Matthew Kennedy's son later said, Payson got Cornish miners up here to work. He lived at Woodstock. He had a fine pair of horses to drive up here, and eight-dollar brandy was none too good for him to drink. But when the head man among the miners died after a while, the others didn't seem to know much about the business. The men in the company got disgusted, and the thing stopped. Kennedy got his land back, and in 1859 sold it to Alexander Taggart, who worked it for another 20 years. Mason's failure did not dampen the enthusiasm for finding gold in Bridgewater. We don't know which mine this was, but it shows the rumors that persisted, and it could never be substantiated. I included this slide because it gives a sense of the land areas that are involved, in this case 350 acres, and also two crushing machines. Companies often have more than one mine, and the landscape is dotted with test pits that presumably didn't pan out. That makes it very difficult to determine which mine was which. The Carboneau mine, for example, is much older than the Carboneau family's, family's presence in Bridgewater, but which one was it? And I have not succeeded in, in figuring that out. For the most part, the gold miners were not local residents. One notable exception was Frank McKenzie, owner of the Bridgewater Woolen Mill and president of the Mineral Hill Gold Mining Company. The mine immediately adjacent to Mineral Hill was the Ottaquisha Gold Mine run by the Honorable Edgar S. Moulton, then serving as mayor of Fitchburg, Massachusetts. <coughs> Most people think of gold mining in terms of placer mining. That's the traditional gold pan and, silver and, and sluice box method that was used in pump. That's not what was happening in Bridgewater. This was load mining. Veins of quartz were mined and the ore crushed to extract minute quantities of gold. We don't know what the mines in Bridgewater looked like, but this photograph of the Rooks Mine in Plymouth has survived, and they're probably fairly similar. In the very upper left is the mine shaft, and that's probably the crusher in the house on the left. And those would be offices and other, other spaces over there. This is a small mine up on Baker Hill, and I did two photographs because you can see on the right that's the quartz that they were trying to take out. Mm -hmm. 
you needed to have a road in order to get the ore out. And in this case, the main road you can see is, is fairly obvious. But if you look over here, there's another much older, more jungled over road. And if you, if you follow that for a short distance, you come to a mine. It's fairly jungled over, but, but uh, you can see where they've excavated the, the area in front. And I honestly don't know how far back that goes. That is between, if you went from Baker Hill over to, to above Daly Hollow, about halfway is, is where that, it's, it's up above the Carbonell mine. I can show you on a map, but I can't really, there's not a lot of reference points that I can use to, to, to pinpoint it. And where you find a mine, you generally find piles of, of ore, tailings. This is directly across the street from the, from the, the previous picture. No, I would say that, that almost none of these are on public land. Um, I mean, I, people walk on this land all the time. So I, I don't think that anyone would get upset if you, you, you took a walk. And, and I, I think if you decided to go, to go down mine shafts, that's probably a slightly different matter. But if you're just taking a walk, it's interesting. And no, not all of them. Uh, But, yeah, there's a couple that are, are right on the line with the person who, who owns uh, the old Perkins property. And, and there's some on that, too, but, um, okay. Some of the, the tailings piles are, are quite large. Th this is the Pioneer Mine. Um, which is one of the ones that's right, we're right on the line between the, between the two. Um, again, that's the actual mine itself. Not much danger of, of going into it. And honestly, don't know how deep it is, but this was a dry summer and it was still full of water. Yeah, of course. Uh, can you go back? Uh, you see that? And then go to the one before that. Of, of what they pulled the, these are the tailing piles. And this is actually a piece of it. This is the ore that they, that they mined and, and never, presumably never took to the crusher. This is a small piece of it. And I'll leave it up here if anybody wants to see it. But it's literally just taken off of that pile. Um, there's no, no, nobody else would, would pile up an enormous load like that. And they probably decided it wasn't paying off. So they, they, when they quit, they just left this stuff. Didn't leave the equipment, but they left the, the ore that they never processed. So that's, that's essentially how you can tell. And it's also, I mean, there's, you go back to the, um, one more. You see it. it. I couldn't get the whole of it in, but it's very obvious that somebody has, has dug one huge hole in there. And there's no other Nobody else was digging enormous holes in there. <laughs> this is either the Taggart Mine or the Quartz Hill Mine. It's up off Fancher Road. Next one. And this is the, the vein of quartz that they were mining. The entrance to the mine is right there. And they just were following that back and, and mining it out. And, and then they take it off to a crusher. But it's, it's not on a road. It's, it, it's, it's up off Fancher, Fancher Road. Yeah. And that one, that one is complicated because the easiest access to it is, is on private property, but it's not the people who own the mine. So, you know, if you can, can get permission to walk across, that's the easiest way to find it, but, but they don't own it. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure who does own it. Um, it's a it's a large land tract. And that's that's the shaft. The mine's largely collapsed. All of that was pieces of the ceiling that have fallen down. And that's my bro my brother, who is much braver than I was. Um, that's not daylight at the end. That's just his flashlight, and he's standing on the edge of an enormous precipice that drops. 
<laughs> I didn't go. <laughs> Okay. Bone mining required equipment and thus money. This is a blade ore, stone and ore crusher from 1893. Frazier and Chalmers, were, they were a mining supply company and their catalog is, is uh, really valuable in, in helping to understand what these people needed. This on the right is, is a fairly recent photograph of a Blake ore crusher being used probably in England. And you can see they, they feed the big rocks in and the small ones pile up at the bottom. Crushers came in all sh shapes and sizes depending upon the volume of ore that you wanted to process. This, this is Major Horace Crusher up in Bridgewater Shattagy, uh, built in 1902. Probably one of the reasons that the mines all failed is the amount of capital that was required to buy all of the equipment. And they never, you had a huge upfront investment that um, really never, you, they never found enough ore to, to, to pay off the cost of, of, of getting set up, much less to, to pay off their stockholders. This is a diagram of essentially the same thing. The ore comes in on carts at the top, and it's essentially gravity fed through two or three crushers. And the particles end up on the bottom on those, those tables, at which point they're put into a steel drum with plates that are coated with mercury. The mercury f absorbs the gold and forms an amalgam, which is then burned off in order to recover the gold. And the, the uh, environmental and, and work safety implications of that are, are, are really rather horrifying. Um, I'm sure all that water just was dumped right back into the brook. And the, the mercury is probably still there. But it's, that method is still in use in the third world today. Around 1897, one of my favorite characters arrived in Vermont, Major Edward Lemaire Whitten Hoare. Hoare was said to be a retired officer in the Royal Engineers and an international mining expert. By 1901, he was in Bridgewater, where on October 21st, he signed the guest register at the Bridgewater Hotel. It's the second. Um, often the most interesting aspect of these people is not their time in Bridgewater. Edward Hoare was a gardener's son born in Wales in 1840, and as a young man, enlisted in the Royal Engineers as a private. While stationed in London, the handsome young soldier met and became enamored of a rising young comic opera star by the name of Elizabeth Nibbs. Her stage name was Lizzie Lemure. The attraction was mutual, and after they married in 1871, Lizzie gave him $100 to buy his discharge from the army. Edward pocketed the money, deserted from the engineers, and went to Chicago with Lizzie hot on his heels. <laughs> they lived in Chicago for eight years with, with Edward working as a civil engineer for the railroad. In about 1880, the childless couple brought Lizzie's 16 year old niece Emily over from England. Not long thereafter, Emily was found to be in the family way. And the lurid details of the ensuing divorce were covered by virtually every American newspaper. It was the only fame that Edward Hoare didn't invent. <laughs> The self-styled major and his new wife relocated to Bayonne, New Jersey, and raised three daughters. By 1901, he was the president of the Northeastern Mining Company, which operated the, the Sunnycrest Mine above Daly Hollow and built both the crusher and a dormitory for workers up in the Shattagee. Okay. Within two years, the money had run out, and Major Hoare was gone. He died in New York in 1913, vastly more distinguished in his obituary than he ever was in life. <laughs> Ironically, he's buried with his daughter's family in Riverside Cemetery in Woodstock. Hoare's Bridgewater interests were acquired by the Oriental Mining Company run by Benjamin and Joseph Fignant of Springfield, Massachusetts. They were already here and in partnership with Oscar Washburn on Baker Hill doing business as the Springfield Mining Company. 
Benjamin Fignat was a phys physician born in Quebec in 1843. By 1884, he was in Springfield, where he invested $4,000 in a 120th interest in an electric motor, and then sued the inventor for selling twice the amount of stock that he had issued. In 1912, the Fignans established the Canado American Gold Mining Company. This was essentially the last gasp for gold mining in Bridgewater. Benjamin Fignan died in 1916, and his interest in the mines passed to his wife, Alicia. It's unclear what, if any, actual mining was going on at that point. Joe Fignat remained in Bridgewater until the 1920s, still believing in the area's mining potential. On February 24, 1924, the town of Bridgewater issued a notice of unpaid taxes on the property owned by the Otacuchi and Canado American Gold Mining Companies. That's really the end of the story, but it could easily have been said to end with Benjamin Fignat's death in 1916. And finally, my epitaph for the Bridgewater gold mines, penned by my brother over some four or five months. <laughs> People have claimed the whole thing was a hoax, but how does a hoax run for more than 70 years? There's gold here. There simply isn't enough of it to make the extraction financially possible. The enduring question is why a succession of investors continued to put money into mines when there was absolutely no evidence of any significant gold here. The answer, at least to me, is that these weren't local people. The only locals were Matthew Kennedy, who had the good sense to take what he could get and buy a farm in Iowa. And, <laughs> and Frank McKenzie, a mill owner who probably wasn't depending on, on the outcome. The others were all a certain type. Restless, inventive, sometimes ethically questionable, but not criminal. I suspect that's true for California, Australia, the Klondike as well. The difference, between, the difference being that in those cases, there was actually enough gold there to make some people wealthy. As I mentioned when I started, my research is very definitely a work in progress. I began with the vision of creating a map in which I could identify every mine and have some sort of accompanying text that would tell when it was operating and who ran it. And that's not possible. It's just much more confusing than that. So I'm still, still working on it. Um, I would love to hear from those of you who, who know things about this. Um, questions, welcomed, uh, observations. There are lots of newspaper articles with very optimistic anecdotal observations. They all seem extremely unreliable. Uh, it's always, someone said that he saw so-and-so who came down with specimens that look really, really good. <laughs> but there's no news that says, I mean, the, the, the next news is that the mine goes out of business. The state never got involved with kind of I, The reports of the state geologists were issued every year. And I think if you went through from 1850 to, to, to 18, well, to, to say to 1900 or 1910, they probably, I haven't done that yet, but they probably will mention what's been found. And that's probably as reliable a source. I mean, it's, he's an actual geologist. He's, he's uh, presumably not, not uh, trying to sell stock or, or newspapers. So uh, that would be a very good thing to do. I've, people have said that. They've also said that it was a hoax. But if you were, allegedly, you, you, you take the, the birdshot out of the shotgun shell and you fill it up with gold nuggets and then you blast it. But what these people are doing is, it's load mining, so what they want is the quartz. And if they bend down and pick up a gold nugget on the ground, it's going to seem silly even to them. That's not how the process was working. So I, I tend to think that's a myth. Yes, and, and I think he was panning. So again, that's what they were doing. If you go to Buffalo Brook in Plymouth, 
on a nice day, you'll still find five or six people panning in there. Yeah, where, where you can. I think that part of that's a state park, and I'm not sure where, there are areas, and it says with signs, where you're allowed to pan and where, where you're not. But there are a lot of people still out there trying to have fun with it. Interesting. I mean, it's a different thing because you don't need to have a lot of equipment. You just need a gold pan. And that's what my brother was doing when he, when he was getting those. And, and you know, in, in truth, that's Plymouth, but, but it's the same thing. If you have to buy the crusher, you've got to buy the, all of the rest of the, the stuff, I think you never catch up. So none of these people ever found enough gold to, to make a fairly expensive process work out. But if you go, that's absolutely right. Uh, if you go to the census reports, for example, for every 10 years for, for Bridgewater, there's only one person throughout that entire time who identifies himself. You have to list your profession as a gold miner, and that's Oscar Washburn. The rest of them are presumably foreign labor, the, the, whether they're the Cornish, uh, Major Hoare was supposedly brought over Italians. Um, so that they put them in the dormitory, they work there, but they don't fill out the census reports because that's not where they live. And then when they're done, they go presumably to, to somewhere else. So I don't think there were very many instances of, of people who actually, actual native Bridgewater residents who were working for the mines. They must have shopped at the stores, you know, the, the corner store and, and, and whatnot, but um, not. It's hard to see that, that, that it really impacted Bridgewater enormously, except in terms of the, of the landscape. They believed that the gold veins ran in a north-south direction. Um, and it, you know, I, I was coming down from Stowe this morning and went over Gold Brook, and I mean, there, there was a group of people mining up there as well. So it didn't just happen here. I think that, that just there were enough people to create sort of a perfect storm in the 1850s. And they all thought that the topography was similar to the West. And so maybe there's gold here. And then there are these, these rumors of people finding huge nuggets. But you never actually get to see the nugget. You never, there's no photograph of the nugget in the newspaper. There's just this anecdotal story. If anybody does, please tell me. Because I, I've asked various uh, longtime residents. And, and there's a Shattagy in Quebec. And there's also one in New York, upstate New York. There was a Battle of Shattagy in the War of 1812, but I don't think it was an American victory. So it seems odd that they would have, have used the name. I don't know what it means. I wish I did. Well, I don't think the technology changed very much. There, there are two, at least, you can go online and you can find the Fraser and Chalmers catalog. It just happens to be 1893 and four that was uh, I don't know, Library of Congress or somebody, somebody had it. Um, there's several different varieties. And you, you could get a small one like the one that was pictured, or you could get the whole damn thing, like the, the one up in, up in uh, Shattagy. So you know, read through it. It's, it's interesting. There, there, yeah, there are multiple different ways of doing it. Uh, most of the, the deeds are all in the town office. So taking the, the grand tour grantee indexes and, and basically looking for anything that said gold mine. Or when, when you know a few of the players, you know, if it's Ira Payson, you know he's not from Bridgewater, so it's, it's gold mine related and he's buying land from either a farmer or he's leasing mineral rights. Um, the um, photographs, I mean, obviously the, the color photographs I, I took myself. 
the, the other ones, uh, the, the newspaper articles all came from um, newspapers.com, which is a really interesting and useful site. Um, so a, few, a couple of things from the Historical Society, but really mostly stuff that I found on my own. <laughs>